Good evening, everyone. Hello and welcome to our fifth webinar of our OPI Indian Education for All Background Knowledge Series on Sovereignty, Tribal Sovereignty. My name is Jennifer Statham and I am an Indian Education for All Implementation Specialist at OPI. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Each web webinar is recorded and participants remain muted with your cameras off so we can focus on the presenter and their content. A link to the recording playlist is now available on our Indian Ed webpage at the top of the resources page, as well as on your reminders letter, reminder letters that you will receive before each sovereignty webinar. Feel free to use the chat if you have any questions or comments. We'll also take a few minutes at the end of the webinar for Q&A. And I believe in this webinar, we will also be reminding you um, through, throughout to please put your questions there. We want to know what your questions are. Again, the feedback surveys, make sure that you fill those out. Um, your feedback is absolutely valuable and uh, the, the presenters are really taking it to heart. I, I, send, I share it with them anonymously so they don't see um, who it is, but they do get to see their, their feedback and it means a lot to them. Your thoughtfulness has been um, really meaningful to all of us on the Indian Ed team. So thank you so much for, um, for putting your, your thoughts and effort into that. So that, that's only open until tomorrow afternoon though. So make sure that you get those in. And in the meantime, my next guest needs no introduction, Mike Jetty. Mike Jetty is an Indian education specialist here at OPI. We've been working together for the past 11 years. And I think probably most of you know him. He personally considers himself a man of mystery and said he needs no formal introduction. And with that, Mike Jetty, thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, glad to be here today. Uh, you know, Mike Jetty, member of the Spirit Lake Dakota Nation and a Turtle Mountain Anishinaabe descendant. And I uh, work here at OPI. I've been working with Indian education for 31 years now. I started out as a classroom teacher and, um, you know, been working with OPI for 21 years now. And so uh, just glad to be in the position I'm in to share a little bit of information about blood quantum. Uh, Jennifer asked me to present on this topic and uh, I haven't never presented on this particular topic in this way so it's a it's a new presentation for me uh, I have to preface this though that the jokes may not be new but the content is so uh, we'll go with that but uh, this morning I had to give blood I had to go down to the doctor's office and uh, the nurse taking my blood yeah I told him I said uh, I said don't take too much I don't want to get disenrolled and so with that, we'll uh, we'll start our discussion of blood quantum. <laughs> well, thanks for adding that in, Jennifer. So, um, so I want to share my screen. I'll go ahead and um, start presenting. But if you have questions as I'm going through this, throw them in the chat, and we'll do our best to answer them. And if we can't answer them right now, we'll uh, we'll we will get back to you. Um, so, just wanted to start out with this opening cartoon. Um, this is from Marty Tubles. Uh, if you get a chance, check out the newspaper Indian Country Today. Um, great uh, paper covering nationwide news from Indian Country, uh, but he's one of the, you know, the cartoon guys there and uh, really makes you think about stuff. And um, as we go through this, I'm going to share a little bit about the history regarding blood quantum, uh, what it is, where we're at. Also, I'm going to share some uh, tribal membership criteria for the tribal nations here in Montana and talk about how that, you know, weaves in with blood quantum too. So um, thinking about fractions, though, I just saw a statistic that said uh, five out of four kids have trouble with fractions. All right. So you're seeing if you're paying attention. All right. So once again, you, you've heard this before, but, you know, it's the 50th anniversary of the Montana Constitution, and we're the only state that has a constitutional obligation to teach about American Indians. So by you all attending this webinar today, um, you're fulfilling your uh, your role and duty as a good Montana citizen. So give yourselves a pat on the back. And then, of course, Indian Ed for All, you know, what does it mean to be culturally responsive when we teach about contemporary American Indian issues and around a topic like blood quantum? And so I'll be sharing some information 
And I'm just offering my perspective on some of this too. I don't want to speak on behalf of OPI or be, speak on behalf of you know native communities or even my own tribe. Um, I'm just sharing a perspective, but I'm also going to bring in a quote some other folks as we go through this. So, all right. So you're familiar with the essential understandings regarding Montana Indians, and I'm going to cover several of these today, but essential understanding too, talking about who are native people today. And then I'm also going to hit on a federal Indian policy, a history from you know American Indian perspectives, and then also tribal sovereignty. But I love this quote. Uh, Jennifer mentioned the uh, ontological and epistemological issues last week during the webinar. And so I'm going to share this quote with you. Um, as we think about our essential understandings, you know, they may look simple on the surface, but you can really go deep. And I love what this uh, researcher from Australia said. Um, she was out here visiting us in Montana a couple of years ago, but she was trying to promote Aboriginal education for all in Australia. But she looked at our essential understandings and she said this, you know, they might look simple, but you could talk about political, historical, contemporary, as well as ontological and epistemological aspects. And I love saying those last two words because it makes me sound smart. But when you think about epistemology, you know, what is true? What is what is your truth? You know, and, and thinking about identity issues and then getting this thing of blood quantum imposed on that, it's really um, caused a lot of confusion, I think, with folks too. But um, hopefully we'll get at some of these epistemological issues as, as we go through this, this notion of blood quantum. But just know that tribes since time immemorial have had their own systems of determining who a member is. Like with the Dakota tribe, we have a hunka ceremony and it's, it's a making of relatives. And so, you know, you could bring someone into your family through a, a traditional ceremony. And I know tribes still have adoption ceremonies and naming ceremonies. And so there's that kind of stuff that still happens in the midst of uh, these colonial kind of imposed notions of race, you know, and blood quantum that you know, some tribes still use as part of their membership criteria. So just keep that in mind as I go through this. So you can break down these essential understandings into the four themes of diversity, culture, history, and sovereignty. And in thinking about diversity, you might talk to 10 different Native Americans and you'll get 10 different opinions or perspectives on blood quantum. And so you know, this is a complex issue. And so just keep that in mind as, as I go through this. This always comes up. And so I just thought I'd put it up front. Uh, what term should we use? Um, I encourage you to be tribal specific when you can. And even better, you know, use the names of the tribes and own languages when, when teaching. So, um, but thank God we finally got rid of that offensive term in, in our nation's capital, you know, Redskins. And I'm glad we've moved beyond that term and referring to uh, Native Americans, but indigenous, uh, First Nations, tribal nations. Um, I've been using those terms a lot more recently to reaffirm tribal sovereignty. And so, but use whatever term you feel comfortable with in talking about big general groups. But if you can be tribal specific, I encourage you to do that. And I'll share some tribal specific examples of uh, um, membership criteria and how they use blood quantum. And it gets at this point, um, looking at history from multiple perspectives. And I love this last bullet. You know, it's not about blame, shame, or guilt, looking at some of these issues. It's really taking an honest and accurate and inclusive look where our country's been, where we're at today, and how we're all moving forward together. And um, thinking about blood quantum, you know, where we've been in the past with it, where we are right now. And if tribes still continue to use blood quantum into the future, we might just, um, you know, go out of existence with our own membership criteria. And so it's just, it's interesting to think about these issues, but, you know, these problems of the future, you know, started a long time ago and we're still working through them. All right, so we're gonna talk about race here for a second. Uh, you cannot talk about blood quantum without talking about, uh, you know, the racist past of our country. So 
some folks don't like to hear that, but it's a reality. You know, um, the myth of American democracy is that we started out great and we've been getting better ever since. Well, that's not quite true. Um, there's been a lot of institutionalized racism that has persisted in our country's history. And when you look at American Indians and race, it's, it's across the board. But we think about this, well, when did, when did this start? Um, you know, it actually started with African Americans. They used to have something called the one drop rule. If you had one drop of African American blood or black blood, you were considered black. That was it, done deal. And so, you know, think about the racist ideology that exists within that. With Native Americans, you know, it was like if you had to be at least a quarter degree to be Native, you know, have, you know, that percentage. And so it's interesting thinking about full blood, quarter blood, eighth blood. You know, this started a long time ago, but it has very racist roots in, in how we define races. And I'll, I'll share some of that here. Um, this notion of manifest destiny, um, you know, it's like that has a racist ideology embedded within it. You know, who, who is the dominant race, the God given, the chosen race of people? that you know they've been given this land and they're going to civilize all the Indians but what do you do with uh, the folks already here and how do you define them and so it's interesting how um, racism was you know justified through biology and I'll, I'll share an example of that but here's this note here about an 1866 Virginia decree you know every person with one-fourth or more Negro blood would be considered a color person Whereas every person not colored having one fourth or more native blood would be deemed an Indian. And so they were talking about this, you know, in, in Virginia in the 1860s. Um, and way back before that, you know, if you go here, you know, in 1705. And so these notions of race have uh, been around for a while. But I mentioned uh, manifest destiny. You know, I'm just curious, does anybody use this in your classroom right now? Um, you know, we do a visual thinking strategy. We use this as one of our lesson plans for social studies. But, you know, this notion of racial and cultural superiority plays into these things like blood quantum and allotment. Um, and this was uh, painted, I think, in what, 1873. And so it was a few years before the Allotment Act was passed. Um, but just, you know, you analyze this picture, what's going on in it, what's happening, what's happening to the Native people. Um, there was this notion that Indians would be the, the vanishing race, that there wouldn't be any Natives left after a while, you know, and so um, I think that's reflected in this, you know, what, what is civilization? Um, you can really dig deep on some of these old, old pictures. But, and we talk about, you know, where did blood quantum come about then um, as official policy was as a result of the Dawes Act, and how are you going to determine who is a native, you know, at the government level. So, you know, when the Dawes Act got passed, they were signing these plots to different native people. You'd go to the Indian agent and sometimes just by looking at you, they'd say, oh, full blood. Or they might just look, well, he doesn't look quite native. He's a, you know, a half blood. And so even those early determinations were kind of at the discretion of who that particular Indian agent was on that reservation. Um, and so think about that. And then you tie in notions of racial and cultural superiority into that. It's, it's interesting stuff. And so um, we look here about this. Um, Jennifer and I were talking about this, about, you know, people who were mixed blood were diff given different types of land versus full bloods because the assumption was, you know, a full blooded, you know, native person wasn't just they weren't just quite intelligent enough. You know, if they had a little bit of mixed blood ancestry, oh, they got some white ancestry that'll, you know, increase their intelligence or whatever. But it's just fascinating when you dig deep into this stuff. And so what does it mean to be native? And, you know, so this, you know, this quantification, I guess, you know, started a long time ago, but it has, you know, very racist roots. And an example of that is, um, you've probably heard of the uh, biologist Linnaeus. And if you're a science teacher, you know, he classified the plants, you know, kingdom, genus, species, and all that. 
But Linnaeus was a reflection of the time in our country's history. And these scientists also had these racist beliefs. And so Linnaeus, if you look on the, in this description, he categorized the races. And um, of course, Europeans are you know, at the top, but you think about American Indians and what he says about them, you know, uh, regulated by customs, they're obstinate, um, paints himself with red lines, uh, European, you know, look at all that. Uh, fair, hair yellow, brown, flowing, gentle, inventive. Um, for Asians, you know, severe, covetous, governed by opinion. You know, African Americans, you know, negligent, indolent, crafty. Uh, but, you know, so here's uh, one of the leading biologists in the world, you know, that folks, you know, uses his classification, but they probably aren't aware that uh, Linnaeus also classified races to help justify this, you know, cultural superiority of, of white people and uh, using science to do that. Um, and thank God we progressed behind that. But I put this cartoon in there, uh, two kids walking home from school. Really? You don't look like an Indian. Well, you know, what do Indians look like today? I think, uh, you know, there's, there's still this notion about to be a real Indian, you had to have lived in the past. What does it mean to be a real Indian? Um, those are, you know, serious philosophical issues. Um, and in thinking about that, uh, this summer I was in Butte, Montana, and I ran into a guy with a necklace on. And it had five of those uh, Indian head nickels. And I said, hey, what's the story behind your necklace? He said, I'm trying to be a quarter Indian. And so uh, another, another bad blood quantum joke for you there. And so, you know, thinking about the reflection in our country's history, you know, you got to put this stuff in its historical context. Um, this is a spelling test that uh, when I was teaching at Montana State University, I found the actual book. It's called The Graded School Speller. But this was used in Dallas, New York, Chicago, all across the country. This was a spelling test that kids were taking in 1908. But look at these words, you know, extinction. The race seems doomed to extinction. Um, if you were at the presentation last week, um, just talking about the amount of native population and the de decrease around the turn of the century, no wonder folks thought, you know, Indians were going to go away. Um, Look at these terms, uh, treacherous, torture. At least there's one positive in there about steadfast friends. <laughs> Fiendish, disdain, moccasins. It's moccasins, dead and all sound, sneaky. Um, you know, speaking of moccasins, my dad said, Mike, you should never criticize someone until you've walked a mile in his moccasins. And I asked him why. And he said, well, that way you can be a mile away, plus you got his moccasins. So a little piece of advice for you. Warfare, lenient, rarely lenient to captives. And so, you know, you think about all these stereotypes that existed just in our spelling curriculum that went out nationwide to folks, you know, where'd they get these notions of Indians? Now, um, fast forward it to cartoons and stuff. I included a, a, a Bugs Bunny cartoon in here because it ties into blood quantum. And some of you may have seen this before, but Thinking about these old cartoons, uh, Looney Tunes, Peter Pan, Mighty Mouse, you put these, you analyze these in their historical context, but watch this clip and, um, and then just take a second to think about it. One little, two little, three little engines. Four little, five little, six little engines. Uh-oh, sorry, that one was a half-breed. Seven little, eight little, nine little engines. Ten little engine boys. Sec just sit there for a second, think about that. So, you know, that's a cartoon. That, you know, kids, I watched Bugs Bunny growing up, Looney Tunes. But you know, I remember seeing that when I was a kid, too. And um, how's that, how do you internalize stuff like that? Um, but it's fascinating when when you take some of the stuff, look at it, you know, well, this one's a half breed um, that was being perpetuated in our, you know, children's cartoons and then cartoons like, um, you know, good old Peter Pan, 
Um, at least Disney now is putting out disclaimers. I don't know if Looney Tunes will, but at least Disney, you get all these stereotypical representations of Indians and in Peter Pan where they're, you know, whooping and hauling around and just, you know, acting goofy, nothing that's authentic in there. But you put it, this cartoon in its historical context that definitely reflected the time period it was made. 1953, you know, we still had segregation. You know, African Americans couldn't vote in a lot of states. Indian people couldn't vote yet. And so, you know, they, these things reflected the time period. And so, you know, that notion of cultural appropriation and how's that fit into how people view themselves. Um, I grew up on the Crow Creek Reservation in South Dakota. My mom and dad worked for a Catholic boarding school and the nuns were my babysitters. And one day this, uh, one of the sisters uh, babysitting me said, your dad's a nice Indian man. And I got all upset and I said, my dad's not an Indian, he's a good guy. And so at a very young age, six or seven, I had already seen cartoons like this and I'd already internalized that Indians were the bad guys, even though I was in a Native American community, Native family, but how did I view Indians, it, you know, seen through the, the lens of the media? But at least Disney now is putting disclaimers on this stuff. But blood quantum ties into this too, you know, who is real, who's a native? What's this all mean? Um, I'm talking about the term breed, at least the Montana legislature passed a, a law a few years ago, removing that name because we used to have these places, place names called half breed, our breed town. And uh, these were real places in Montana. And, but, you know, finally there was a, a bill passed, uh, help sponsored by, um, you know, um, Nicholas Vroman, uh, uh, cultural historian here related to the Métis and the Michif, but you know often associated with breeds but at least um, another way we've pro been progressing as a state to get rid of some of these you know negative connotations and so going back to essential understanding too now well who are native people um, as a general rule as someone who has some biological Indian ancestry and is recognized as an Indian by a tribe blood quantum but every tribe has their own enrollment criteria and some tribes may not use blood quantum. And so keep that in mind too. It, it's up to that tribal group to determine how they're gonna choose their members and they may or may not choose to use blood quantum. And so in thinking about that, I, I threw this lesson plan in there because I think we still have the stereotype that you know it, real Indians just lived in the past and so this is a, a grade two lesson plan all about how natives lived in the past and how do they live today. But the main piece of artwork in this lesson is a, a piece of art by a student from uh, Crow. It was actually a student at Wyola. Drew this picture about what Indian Ed for All means to her. And she talked about you know, her Crow culture and identity being the foundation for her, but living in a house today. But you know, who are natives? Who are natives in the past? Who are, who are natives today? And what does it mean to be a real Indian or a real Dakota or a real Crow? Um, this is a great book about identity. Uh, it was written by a, a high school principal in Billings, but this notion about um, you don't have to be an either or, it could be a both and more. And so I, I love that message. You know, you can draw on your French ancestry, you can draw on your Dakota ancestry or whatever. And so it doesn't have to be this either or, you can, you know, celebrate all of your cultural identity and that's reflected in this particular book. So our new social study standards are great for analyzing complex topics like this. You know, you can throw out some inquiry questions, you can gather some information. That's what I was doing as I was preparing this presentation. I was saying, well, what's out there in regards to blood quantum? Um, and so I found some interesting stuff, but Here's this third grade standard that helps reaffirm native identity. We actually are asking every third grader from Ikalaka to Broadus to Poplar to Dylan to Helena to Butte to know what tribes call themselves in their own language. And to me, that is so powerful. And so we're gonna know, instead of saying Crow, we'll say Abzalika, instead of Blackfeet, Pakani. You know, to me, I think that's so cool that kids in classrooms are gonna be doing that. And uh, so we have a website called montanatribes.org where you can hear the names of the tribes spoken in their languages. But 
that's just a part of it too. And I think that helps reaffirm Native student identity in those classrooms when you're hearing, you know, Nakota or Nakona instead of Assiniboine. And I think that makes me feel good. And so, so one of these other essential understandings is talking about reservations. You know, these reservations were land reserved by tribes. But within that, you get something that's coming called the Dawes Act now, right? And so here are the, the large land base areas. And then 1877, the Dawes Act comes in and these areas shrink. And then they shrink even more once the Indians start getting allotments. Um, and so how, how do we get to this point? Well, you know, this federal Indian policy, it's, uh, it's very long and it's very complex, but you know, the Dawes Act fits in with that. So say, well, I don't know anything about the Dawes Act. What is the Dawes Act? Well, we have lesson plans on the Dawes Act on our website to help you understand that. We've had previous webinars on tribal sovereignty where they dove a little bit deeper into the Dawes Act. But it fits in with this, you know, here's this, you know, allotment period, you know, folks are moving across the West. How do you free up land? Well, these lands were treaty protected. And so let's just pass a law, you know, called the Dawes Act allotment, um, open up for settlement. Uh, the, the millions of acres of land got lost as a result of allotment. But how did tribes get their allotments? You know, it was like use, you know, blood quantum to determine that. Um, and speaking about the impacts of allotment um, and how that impacts people today, if you have not watched the film uh, about Eloise Cabell, 100 years, you know, we sent a copy of this DVD out to every school library. This movie does a great job of talking about the Dawes Act, talking about allotment and how that impacts Native people today. But these are quotes from students here in Helena about um, what they thought about this movie. And so just like everybody learns about Rosa Parks, I want everybody to learn about Eloise Cabell and know what she did to stand up on behalf of Native people. Um, and, you know, I got some money as a result of the Cobell settlement. A lot of my friends did too, um, but it varies from individual too. But, you know, how did you determine to get that money? Well, it goes back to allotment and being on those rolls um, and being an enrolled tribal member. And so, you know, this land got broken up there was a checkerboarding of land, you know, who, you know, who determined who was going to get the land. Uh, it's fascinating. I mean, this, we're still dealing with this today. And so, but this assimilation notion was built into this, you know, we're just going to assimilate Native Americans. They're all going to become good farmers. That'll solve the Indian problem. They'll just become white like everybody else. But we know that that those that didn't happen and uh, tribes are still dealing with the trauma as a result of some of this um, and so if you're not the expert on allotment or blood quantum we have a website called montanatribes.org and i just did a screenshot of shane doyle a co-educator you know shane's actually talking about blood quantum and the dawes act and how all that came about and you know but he also mentions you know what i said earlier historically tribes had their own membership criteria it wasn't this imposed thing um you know you can hear dick little bear talk about the dawes act vernon finley also shame some, sh shares some perspectives regarding the dawes act and so there's resources out there so you can bring in a virtual guest speaker so if you're not too comfortable talking about this topic you can bring in shane doyle and he can be the one sharing his perspective on it around blood quantum and uh just to say sovereignty, tribes have their inherent sovereignty to determine their own membership. And so that's, I'm going to say that a lot during this presentation. And so how's this fit in with blood quantum? Well, two lesson plans I just rewrote, one for middle school and one for high school is about who is an American Indian? Um, philosophical issue, but then you can also get at it from a membership issue. How did the tribes determine their membership? And so in these lesson plans for the middle school one, you, students actually go in and analyze tribal constitutions and look at the membership clauses or the section. Well, here's this tribe's membership criteria. But then in the high school lesson, they dig a little deeper into the philosophical issues and maybe look at some of the contemporary issues regarding 
using blood quantum and identity. And so uh, Jennifer's got the two links to these lesson plans, but um, students, they get some close analytical reading skills from these. Um, they examine tribal constitutions. And so it helped reaffirm tribal sovereignty, but then they also talk about, you know, historical issues too, regarding membership criteria. And so I pulled out some older research I, I had from uh, working with TRIO programs back in the day and thinking about Native Americans and identity. And so, um, but we have this poster series that we put out. Um, there used to be a really cool poster series called uh, Have You Ever Seen a Real Indian? And it was produced by the Native American Rights Fund. And then we took that idea here in Montana and we said, well, let's put out a poster series called Honor Yourself. Um, this is Dustin Whitford from Rocky Boys. There's a picture of, um, you know, the new series called Making Montana Proud, featuring young Native American role models who are just doing cool things for, you know, not only their tribe, but for our state and, you know, our nation and, and possibly the world. Um, thinking about identity issues, there's Mariah Gladstone down here in the corner. She's got her own indigenous cooking channel, Indigit Kitchen, you know, uh, traditional foods, you know, wellness. But I love her t-shirt. Her t-shirt says, I'm not your Pocahontas bro. Um, kind of looking at identity issues and, you know, Native American women being referred to as Pocahontas and, and things like that. So another uh, person from our poster series, on Yourself, uh, you know, so, and she's a pharmacist. And we put up these posters just to, you know, debunk, uh, you know, some of the negative stereotypes that exist out there around American Indians. Um, it's really tied into identity issues. But what's this mean? What is Indian student identity? Um, and so this is where I said I went into some of my old research looking at, at TRIO programs and programs that serve students at the higher ed level. And so this is, uh, I don't know why there's sound effects in there, but that's, that's all good. But this is talking about acculturation, you know, and looking at assimilate, assimilation. And, you know, this was a, you know, official government policy to assimilate natives, you know, through education. Um, and so... But what does this mean for Native students? And so these are some of these researchers that took these things and you know tried to put Native students in categories. And uh, there are these four basic levels of acculturation that this researcher uh, Garrett back in 1996 put together. And somewhere I've got the uh, all the sites on this stuff in some of my research in grad school. But you know we have uh, that's kind of cool these transitions here. Traditional, marginal, bicultural, and assimilated. And, and what's that mean? And so there may be images of people popping up in your head as you hear these terms. I'm thinking of folks I know that are very traditional. I'm thinking of folks I know that might be considered marginal. And even some people I know that could be considered assimilated. But what's that mean? And these aren't fixed categories. These are just some categories that some researchers put together to help them better serve Indian students in higher ed. And so, you know, traditional, generally speak in their native language, practice only traditional customs and beliefs. And there might be some students on that continuum that would fit in that category. Marginal, you know, kind of on the borderline, may speak some native, may speak English, but not really know that, you know, have uh, some identity issues going on. Maybe they're enrolled, maybe they're not. Um, but some of the research said folks that are having struggling with some of these identity issues um, have some difficulty resulting from cultural conflict. And that's interesting to think about. So, you know, these aren't my categories. These are some stuff people put out there just to talk about native identity and who are native people today. Um, this notion of being bicultural, you know, accepted by dominant society, practice both mainstream values and traditional values. Well, what does mainstream values mean, basically? White values, Euro-American values. Um, but you know what? What about their traditional values? And so um, I was in a meeting yesterday where someone said they heard you know, Native Americans talk walking in two worlds. And she said, well, she didn't agree with that. She was Salish. She said, we walk in one world and we bring our entire identity to that, but we might switch. 
depending on the situation we're in. Um, and then there's this, this category assimilated, you know, generally accepted by the dominant society, embrace only mainstream culture and values. And so there was those different categories, but how's this fit into blood quantum? Um, could you be an enrolled tribal member and be completely assimilated? Maybe. Um, could you be a traditional person, but not be a tribal member, but have lots of blood from different tribes? Maybe. And so, you know, these aren't set categories. I think there's a lot of uh, leeway, but, but it's, it's interesting to just set a discussion. And so we talk about self-identification. Who are you? How does the community see you? And then how does the rest of the world see you? Well, for tribal people, you know, it's, it could be a lot of stuff. Uh, it could be class, education, region, religion, gender, and how all that fits into there. And so, um, and so I like this quote that I discovered in a paper. And so, and thinking about this, I think I got to, yeah. Um, so we're thinking about identity. Um, they might be a mixed blood on the res, um, or someone might use the term breed, or Dakota or Lakota, they might say Yeshka, which means interpreter or translator. But then they might say Wamoglala or Lakota, or they might say American Indian. So someone might refer to themselves in three different ways, depending on who they're talking to. Um, and so it's, it's a complex issue. And so as we think about identity, let's just tie this back into Maslow. And um, we all probably went to school, you know, learning about Maslow and our teacher ed programs. But one thing I learned here when I was at OPI and I, I love my job because I'm always learning new information about Native tribes. Um, when Lana Running Wolf was working here at OPI, she let us know that uh, Maslow had spent time with the Blackfeet, with the Blackfoot. And uh, there's this whole body of research that exists up in Canada that talks about Maslow and his hierarchy needs, but then how's this fit in with Native perspectives? And um, to me, this fits in with this notion of, you know, who are Native people? And, uh, you know, how can we reaffirm our own cultural strengths and ideals and how's that fit in with identity? Um, and so I think this is, this is powerful stuff, but I wanna see every teacher ed program, you know, talk about this and what's that mean, you know, from a Blackfoot perspective versus a Western perspective. The Western perspective puts, you know, the individual at the top. Well, it's like you start out self-actualized and then you're, from the indigenous perspective, you're gonna help perpetuate your culture and language and ceremony thousands of years into the future. It's not about you, it's about the collective whole, the tribe, the, the we, um, and a, a different way of thinking about stuff. You know, someday we're all gonna be an ancestor. And uh, what are we doing right now to help preserve our language, culture, and identity? And for native people, those are, you know, you know, serious issues to think about, you know, 500 years from now, I still want people to speak Dakota. I still want them to speak Blackfeet or Pakuni or Mzalika or no matter what it is. And so that notion of cultural perpetu per per perpetuity, I think is important. And if we keep using blood quantum, are we gonna be, you know, will, they be, will there be any natives left in the future? Um, and so a great resource in the Museum of the American Indian is, uh, native photographers in the field. And um, Taylor Irvine, who's in the Flathead Reservation, did a whole uh, photographic ex expose about blood quantum and she called it Reservation Mathematics, Navigating Love in America. And uh, she did a little author statement, you know, talking about uh, include the voice of her siblings because um, they're impacted by blood quantum system. And so within this story, you know, there's a, a person who is talking about their one thirty second away from getting a person enrolled. So that's how, you know, but the fractions are so close that they're, the person can't be enrolled based on the tribal criteria. And so, and so this article, this photo expose does a great job of that. And so I link to this in that high school lesson plan. So students can go in and hear from tribal perspectives. And so about blood quantum, it's not just me saying it, they're hearing from various tribal members about real life 
implications of blood quantum and what that means. Um, yeah, and so here's another quote from that. Um, seven stories is what she talks about. And so I encourage you to check it out. Reservation Mathematics, Navigating Love in Native America. Um, so what's this all mean? And so just, just putting it out there for food for thought. But then there's this, um, which an interesting factor. So the BIA has something called the Certificate of Degree of Indian Blood, or Alaska Native Blood, a CDIB. Um, you can talk to a lot of Native American folks and they might have their CDIB card. But this isn't related to tribal enrollment. Um, you could have a CDB, CDIB card and not be enrolled. Um, this is determining who could be eligible for some services, you know, through the BIA. But um, it's interesting. And so um, the BIA has, uh, you know, guidance for how you, you know, apply for one of these cards. And you still have to go through and, you know, prove your descent. You know, maybe go back to a Dawes role or maybe say, hey, um, this was my dad. You know, he was on a federally recognized tribe and here's his blood quantum. And so but this was something I, I discovered when I was doing my research. And um, I still want to find the actual site for this. But it says in 1985, Congress enacted the Court of Blood Amendment Act that said you have to be at least a quarter degree native to get, um, you know, eligibility for some services through the BIA, you know, whether it be a scholarship or something like that, or healthcare or housing. Um, and so that's not counting how tribes determine membership, but this is a federal thing. Um, but I want to do more research on this. So if somebody knows something about this Quarter Blood Amendment Act, let me know, because it was new to me as I was going through putting stuff together for this presentation. And so, um, that's why I'm saying there's a lot of stuff to unpack you know, as we think about these blood quantum issues. And here's another deal here. This is a chart from the BIA, and it, it makes my eyes gloss over. But this is a little chart to determine blood quantum. And so me, my blood quantum is 7 16 That's what I'm listed on as the tribal worlds at Spirit Lake, 7 16 Spirit Lake Dakota. And so my tribe uses at least a quarter degree Indian blood. And so I married, my wife is non-native. And so my daughter, Sapphire, cannot be a tribal member because she falls underneath that quarter degree threshold. Um, but you can see, you could take someone's blood quantum and factor it in here. And so an individual may be looking to, you know, see if they're eligible for tribal membership could, you know, find this chart. And... Uh, see where they fit. But, you know, determining who you are, you know, is it more, is it about blood or is it about culture and language and identity? But, you know, tribes still use a blood quantum. And even the Yaki tribe has what they call a blood quantum calculator. I never heard of this before, but you can slide these little levers around uh, these bars and, you know, the mother's blood quantum, the father's, and then automatically it gets you one at the bottom to say, so if you know your dad's blood quantum or your mom's and you can, or your own, you can go to this little blood quantum calculator and it'll tell you if you get to the quarter degree Indian threshold. Um, but yeah, so this is just one tribe and something they developed, you know, for their members. You know, here's a blood quantum calculator. I'd never heard of that before, uh, but some tribes have that to help determine their membership. Uh, the Department of Interior, They've got, uh, you know, information regarding tribal enrollment and tribal membership requirements. And I really like what they said here. Um, the tribes established membership criteria, you know, based on customs, tradition, language, and then it says end tribal blood. But they may not use that if they choose not to. Like some tribes, you can go back to the Dawes rule. And I'll share the Cherokee example here in a little bit. But you know, so there's a lot of information out there about enrollment, about who determines it, but then you got the BIA having their core degree rule too for eligibility for, you know, federal programs that, you know, target Native Americans. And so, you know, these are, these are complex issues. And so 
So here we go. Um, we'll, let's take a look at blood quantum criteria for different tribes here in Montana. Then I pulled out the tribal constitutions and I just cut and paste in the slides the membership criteria. And so here's Blackfeet. And so anybody having one fourth degree Blackfeet Indian blood or more born after the adoption of this amendment to any blood member of the Blackfoot tribe. And so, you know, this goes back to the Indian Reorganization Act where tribes, you know, could choose to sign on to that federal Indian policy and create a, you know, a form of government kind of based on the U.S. model. Um, but when they did that, a lot of tribes rolled in blood quantum as part of their IRAs, their Indian Reorganization Act governments. Um, but I pasted in this article, and I think this is from the Great Falls Tribune. A few years ago, the Blackfeet were trying to, you know, a group wanted to lower their blood quantum. And, you know, there was protests in the street. People went to the tribal and, uh, offices and, you know, marched around with signs and stuff. You had two different camps that were, you know, some folks wanted to change it. Some people didn't. And it was a very emotional issue. And I think the Blackfeet tribe just left it where it's at. But when some a tribe in Montana was going to lower it, man, it, it, um, it blew up. And so um, folks have a lot of passion. And, um, you know, these are real life issues for people. And so, but yeah, when the, check it out. Google Blackfeet Tribal Blood Quantum. And you'll hear lots of different perspectives from Blackfeet folks regarding blood quantum and, and whether or not they're going to change it. That's up to them. And uh, however they choose to decide that. Um, I just pulled this article off the web uh, December 4th. So yeah, Grand Ron tribe, they vote to limit disenrollment. Tribes can actually disenroll people too. You know, you can enroll folks, but um, this particular tribe in Oregon disenrolled a bunch of people, but then they uh, petitioned and actually got re-enrolled back in the tribe. Um, and so, you know, that's tribes have the power to boot people off roles too, not just, um, you know, accept them in as members. And so there's that. Another way tribes exercise their inherent sovereignty is by disenrolling people. And that has happened over history. Um, here's a couple other articles I just uh, uh, Googled this morning. Um, you know, the American Medical Association supports removing blood quantum. Uh, for medical and education enrollment questions. Um, Red Lake, uh, Minnesota, you know, they expect a rapid decline over the next hundred years, you know, under enrollment criteria. Someone did a population projection study and uh, you could have your kids do this using fractions too, if you want, and then map it out. These hypothetical scenarios of you have X number of members. Here's, uh, you know, average blood quantum. How many years will it take for folks to, you know, basically mathematically put themselves out of existence, you know, if we keep using blood quantum? So it's, it's these are, you know, real, real issues for Indian country. Um, and then ICWA, man, that's going to have huge ramifications for tribal folks because is it, you know, membership, is it racial? Or is it a political status? And for tribes, you know, tribal sovereignty is what really makes Indian people unique in this country. Because of members of federally recognized tribes, we have a unique legal and political relationship with the federal government. And so you think about what does it mean to be a member of the Dakota Nation or Spirit Lake Dakota? Well, my tribe has a unique legal and political relation to, relationship with the federal government. And uh, saying it's not based on race, it's based on a political status. But if ICWA, if the way it goes, the Supreme Court says this is a race-based thing, then civil rights can kick in and say, well, this might have huge ramifications nationwide for tribal sovereignty. If um, determine, de depending how the U.S. Supreme Court just decides this case. Um, and it's, it's, it's scary right now, I guess, for me as a Native person watching what what the U.S. Supreme Court's going to do and how this is going to impact tribes. But um, it goes back into blood quantum and membership criteria and who, who defines who is an Indian. The tribes do. But yet this blood quantum imposed system um, raises some questions with ICWA. Um, so here, here's Fort Peck. 
Fort Peck tribe. Um, talk about, you know, here they are, the act, the Dawes Act is in here. Descendants on a basic roll, one quarter degree Assiniboine or Sioux blood, born prior to the effective date, uh, lineal descent. So, you know, at least a quarter degree, you know, for the Assiniboine and Sioux up at Fort Peck. And then here's some more amendments. Uh, future members, each child of one fourth member born after this date, you know, can be a member. Um, and then they also have something called an associate member which is pretty cool. It's like you could be one eighth, um, but less than a quarter, um, one eighth or more. And so you got this little area between an eighth and a quarter, and you could still be an associate member, but you can't vote, but you're still considered a member. And so um, that's interesting that, you know, Fort Peck chose to go that route, um, which is pretty cool. And that's their right as a sovereign nation to do that. Rocky boys, um, this is what I found for their tribal constitution. And, uh, you know, talking about half, one half blood or more. Um, not, a res not a member of any other tribe. You know, some tribes might include blood from another tribe. Some don't. And so it depends on that particular tribe whose blood they count in determining this, this blood quantum. And so, and then some tribes say you have to live on the reservation, you know, to our to be a member, you know, if you don't, you know, some other things might kick in, but, you know, the majority of Native folks actually live off the reservations in our, in our state and in our country. Um, so, you know, how do you determine membership? Those are big issues. Here's a Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes. Um, they go back to census rolls, you know, as of 1935. Um, so if you can trace your descendancy back to that, um, you know, whether or not they use a quarter degree Indian blood, you know, but if you can trace descendancy back to that census, um, maybe you don't have to be a quarter degree. And so it depends on the tribe and how they determine their membership. Here's Crow, um, you know, someone who possesses at least one quarter degree Crow Indian blood, um, the date of the passage of that constitution. Um, descendants referred to above in their enrollment status. Um, here, this they said dual membership was prohibited. You have to choose. And so, um, like for a lot of folks, you know, it's like you might come from two different tribes. Like my mom was Turtle Mountain Chippewa. My dad's Spirit Lake Dakota. Well, we enrolled with our dad's tribe or my dad's tribe, you know. And so I have uh, cousins that are Spirit like Turtle Mountain. Um, and so it, sometimes it depends on the family too. And so how you're going to choose to go and it might depend on that blood quantum um, you might be living on a blackfeet reservation but you might have a, a higher turtle mountain blood quantum and so you might enroll there so your kids can be tribal members um, it's very complex hey mike we've four... got a couple we've got a couple uh comments and questions in the chat um Let's go for it from Jennifer Smith, we also have a lot of people trying to gain enrollment status in our tribe because we have a casino that brings in income and enrolled members get about 12,000 to 15,000 annually from that gaming revenue. That complicates things as well. It does, Absolutely. and that's where the tribes determine their own membership criteria then. And so folks wanting to be tribal members have to go to the tribes to get enrolled. And so, it's those tribes that determine that eligibility. And so some of those casino tribes, that happened, man. It's just like folks wanted to become a member, you know? And so it's, you know, a lot of it dealt with economics, but, you know, Indian gaming in some places increased tribal enrollment because um, folks said, hey, hey, you know, there's, I want to, I want a piece of the pie, but that, those are real issues too. Um, so, Thanks for bringing that up. What what are their questions? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think you kind of answered this, but that's okay because you know this is a lot of information and clarification is always great. Can a person be a member of more than one tribe if their parents are from different tribes? Most tribes say no. It's like you have to choose. Like with the Crow tribe, dual membership prohibited. And so, say you're Crow and Blackfeet. If you want to be enrolled Crow, you have to you know say I'm going to be Crow. Um, but like me, 
I'll say I'm a spirit lake Dakota and a Turtle Mountain Anishinaabe descendant. I want to acknowledge both. But when I acknowledge both, I say, hey, I'm an enrolled tribal member and I'm a descendant of one. And so that's how a lot of folks might identify. They might say, I'm enrolled with this tribe, but I'm also a descendant of these tribes. And so that's one way folks go about that. Um, does, that uh, make, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, also, I, Jennifer says, I have a friend whose children um, have blood descendancy from three different tribes, but not enough blood quantum from any of those three to be enrolled. So they're not considered Indian or members of any tribe. And um, I'm looking, I think there's, there's one more comment up here. Oh, here we go. Um, so again, from, from Jennifer, by the way, Jennifer Smith, a uh, former director of uh, Hi, Indian Jennifer. Education at Billings Public Schools, and her comments through uh, Callie Rishi Nicholson's uh, webinar on uh, on sovereignty for through the Advocacy Award recipient uh, series that we did last year, which are all recorded and available um, on our website. Uh, it, Jennifer brought up some some really good points about blood quantum, and and that was is why we are presenting on this tonight. So in the comments, she says, "My brother and I are half Native, one quarter Eastern Band Cherokee." our tribe of enrollment, and one quarter Turtle Mountain Band Chippewa. Thus, my nephew is one-eighth blood quantum of each. Because our Cherokee tribe requires one-eighth blood for enrollment, my nephew will be the last enrolled member of our family. Wow. We own land there on the reservation. The tribe requires enrollment, my nephew, oops, sorry, uh, in order to be our own tribal land. Sorry, I'm having a hard time scrolling and when new comments come in. Uh, the tribe requires enrollment in order to own tribal land. Because of this, my nephew will have to sell our family land either back to the tribe or to another tribal member, or we will lose ownership of it when he passes away unless the rules change for his blood, quant for blood quantum during his lifetime. Wow. And I'm yeah, pretty so sure I mentioned these are, you know, real issues for folks, this notion of blood quantum and how that impacts people. There's an example right there. And thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Uh, and, and then um, so if a person is mixed tribes and has a majority of blood being from Native Americans, do they lose out on benefits? If say that again, Jennifer. If a person is mixed tribes and has a majority of blood being from Native Americans, do they lose out on benefits because they don't, they're not part of a, one tribe or another, even if they're Native? Well, they, they might be able to go to the BIA, that CDIB card, um, if they can show that they've got certain amounts of blood from different tribes. The BIA might issue them a certificate of degree of Indian blood so they could be eligible for you know, some federal programs that are designed for Native people. And so I would definitely check it out um, because you may not be enrolled in a tribe, but at least you can do a, a formal system, you know, the BIA, you know, have them say, yes, you know, you do have this official Native blood. Um, so that's that's a route to go. Um, Thank you, Norton everybody. Cheyenne. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, you know, one half or more. Um, but then it goes back to these census rolls. And um, so it's, it's, it's fascinating when you think about this and uh, how much blood and who uses it. And, you know, if it goes back to a tribal role versus, you know, just being a, a certain degree. I mean, it varies from tribe to tribe. Um, but then the Cherokee, here we go. Um, it's like if you can go back you know, to prove that you're on this Dawes roll, um, you have to have a, you know, death certificate, you know, all this stuff. But um, so it's like, you know, it's interesting. Each tribe has their own methods for how they do it. But these guys go right back to those Dawes rolls. And then the, the freedmen are a whole different story at the Cherokee, you know, the African-Americans who married into the tribe. And then, you know, whether or not they're considered real Indians or not, I mean, those are, you know, serious issues. They, they've had some court cases about that um, with the Cherokee and, and their membership. But, you know. Why, 
before you get to to uh, Mr. Vader here, we we have a clarification um, from uh, about that question. If a person is mixed tribe, let's say seven eighths Native American, but has less than one eighth of any tribe, can they still be enrolled in a tribe? Would would they get benefits? It depends on the tribe. Yep. Yeah. It depends and, on the tribe. So they'd have to trace their lineage. Say, hey, you know. Uh, one of my lineage is Little Shell. And uh, maybe I want to approach them and have all the documentation that says the seven eighths or whatever. Or, and uh, maybe they would accept that. But it depends on that particular tribe. So maybe. Um, so th there's another question. Please keep your questions coming, folks. I'm happy to, to um, field them to Mike. Um, hope this is not digressing. If someone is curious about their ancestry, do you trust the Ancestry.com saliva tests? I heard there is not yet a lot of indigenous data for the U.S., not necessarily for enrollment, but just for the sake of knowing. That's a really good question. Yeah, you know, I don't know. Uh, you know, there we were just talking about, uh, you know, who was it up in Browning has some of the oldest DNA ever? You know, um, what, Crawford? Um, it was a really cool story recently that came out about that, but, you know, folk can use that, you know, it's like, say, hey, do I have some common genetic ancestry with natives, you know, it might, you know, just from a personal standpoint, so yeah, that's cool, but, in, you know, as far as enrollment criteria, that probably wouldn't help you, you know, if you want to try and get enrolled, what would help you is going back to your family documentation and saying, hey, I can trace my Great great grandpa back to this Dawes role. I mean, that's really what's going to get you enrolled. But, you know, yeah, those kind of tests are cool. Um, thinking about genetics and, uh, you know, ancestry.com, you know, might you might find some more of your family history you didn't know about. Um, yeah, I threw in a bad cartoon about uh, Darth Vader. You know, he found out he's one tenth Cherokee, so he's a fancy dancer now. Um, I had to throw in at least one bad cartoon about blood quantum there. Um, so here's my tribe. You know, it's like, uh, you know, right here, you know, one fourth. So one quarter again. And so a lot of tribes have that. And I've got a couple other things. So I'm gonna, it's okay if I get us into a philosophical issue now, Jennifer, and then I'll take some more questions. Absolutely. Um, I do want to come back to that question about indigenous data with, um, you know, what's been found out with the Clovis child and then. Oh, um, yeah. Let's, and, let's talk and then, about it right now. Because, you know. Yeah, the, the Clovis, yeah. So that was significant as well as the individual from uh, Blackfeet. Yeah. Well, the Clovis child, if you're not familiar with the story, we have the largest Clovis, Clovis artifact site in North America. And it's north of Livingston, Montana. And back in 1968, they found they were doing some digging. And these construction workers found uh, a burial site and all these objects and tools that were buried with a, a two-year-old child. But they did some genetic testing of this child and they took part of its skull back to Europe and uh, they spent years mapping its genome. And what they, what they found was there's a unique genetic marker that is unique to American Indians in the Americas that doesn't exist anywhere else in the world but you can trace it back to that Clovis child from 12,000 years ago. And then they estimate about 80% of American Indians have a direct genetic link to that kid who was buried, you know, by Livingston, Montana. And so it, it's just fascinating history. And then the, the Blackfeet man who has some of the oldest DNA, I think in the world, wasn't it, Jennifer? Um, or at least in the Americas? In the in the Americas, the Americas, I believe that it matched up with um, from you know south all the way to north though, which dispelled Bering yeah. Land Bridge. Yeah, it's it's fascinating. Yeah, the Bering Land Bridge theory. Um, there's been all kinds of new archaeological evidence that shows that theory is uh, is outdated. You know, there's been archaeological evidence that shows the Indians have been living in the Americas at least twenty three thousand years. Um, twice as long as the old Bering Land Bridge. But um, thinking about identity issues, we have a, a resource called Birthright. And um, I love what Joe McGizek said about these poems. And if you, Birthright is a great way to introduce, you know, complex native topics, you know, through poetry. And identity is one of these. Heather Cahoon is one of our featured poets. She's Ponderay. 
Um, she actually helped uh, revise our essential understandings, but I want you to take a couple minutes and uh, read the poem called Blonde. Powerful poem, you know, talking about identity and uh, what does it mean to be native? And um, is it phenotype? Is it how you look? Is it being enrolled? Is it what's in your heart? What's in your soul? Is it, do you speak? Um, and then here's what Heather said about this poem. He said, I wrote Blonde when I was about 21 years old, you know, looking about, you know, when people are looking to understand who they are. She grew up Indian. But um, she, she said, I didn't necessarily look in yet. And, uh, and so, you know, these identity issues, you know, she can be an enrolled tribal member, but because you look more white, you know, how's that impact you? And, uh, you know, that's impact my identity. Um, living in South Dakota on a Cheyenne River Reservation, one of my friends who was, you know, full blood told me one day, he said, you breeds have it easy. He said, you guys can switch back and forth. You can go hang out with your white friends. You can go hang out with us natives. But he says, I can't change that. You know, I'm, I always look the way I do. And so, you know, it's interesting, you know, when you, in native communities, these 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 discussions about, you know, who is native and uh, your notions about identity. And so Heather, you know, I'm so glad she wrote this poem. It's It's a powerful piece, but you know, what's that mean? And I like what she said. You know, she says, I came to know myself as a light-skinned Indian woman, and that's cool. Um, and then there's Dick Little Bear's poem about warriors today. Um, I really like this poem. And who are Native people today, but I'm, this for purposes of time, we're not going to do Dick's poem, but I'm going to close it off on this cartoon before I, uh, I take questions. And uh, says he's from a northern drum, you know, since we got the holidays coming up. But I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing and uh, open it up for some questions now. So I cruised through a lot of information. Um, blood quantum is a very complex topic. Tribes have their own right to determine who the members are. They may or may not use blood quantum to determine that. Um, but it's interesting, you know, what's this mean for the future? You know, as far as tribes, you know, will they go back and rethink membership criteria? Maybe, maybe not. It depends on the tribe. It's up to them. And uh, whatever they choose, we'll put out here at OPI and say, here's the leadership mem latest membership criteria from Rocky Boys or, or Blackfeet or whatever. Um, we'll just be a voice for that. But um, other, other questions, I uh, do a lot of information at you. And... Um, so, Mike, you know, we've in all of the sovereignty presentations, we've um, touched on the federal policy periods. And I was just wondering if you could give some clarification on what does self-determination and self-actualization actually mean within this context? Can you help us um, dig a little deeper into that? Sure. Well, you know, you know, the self-determination policy kind of grew out of that civil rights era. You know, late 60s, uh, 1975, Indian Self-Determination Act. And uh, President Nixon, I think uh, Shane mentioned this last week too, you know, he, he was a very progressive president, you know, on affirming sovereign rights of tribes and, you know, getting rid of the old policies of termination and relocation, assimilation, and, uh, you know, saying, hey, let tribes determine their own future. And part of that is tribes have the right to determine their own membership criteria. And um, whether or not they choose to use blood quantum. And so that self-determination, I think, is powerful. Tribes are inherent sovereign nations, but yet we have to live within this current political structure. Like I mentioned ICWA. And so, you know, the U.S. Supreme Court and the decisions they make still impact tribes across the nation. And you, you still have to live within that, you know, kind of political system that's been set up. And so tribes, you know, are domestic dependent nations, according to the Supreme Court. 
But within that, they can still make their own laws, determine their own membership, you know, and all those other things associated with governments. Tribes can do that. Um, I don't know. You, know, you, you brought up ICWA. I was really curious about um, something that I learned recently was about the placement programs and how it looked like originally some of the, the outplacement, I, there's a specific term for it. I'm sorry, I'm not remembering it right now, but um, it was hmm. largely run by the Mormon church. Was that the only, <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, I just Spilled coffee all over myself here. I'm glad it's the end of the day. You're, you're just you're just copying me because I did that right before the webinar. So you know it's all glad good. I waited till the end. <laughs> but anyhow, but with ICWA and the, and the Mormon Church, you know, being part of this outplacement was was it? Do you know if it was only the Mormon Church or was that where it started? Or you know, because that could really really affect identity, obviously more so. Or, you know. It, just as much as just being removed from the tribe, but then, you know, you, you're with a very specific um, religious culture. You know, can you talk of any about that at all? No. Um, <laughs> I'm not I'm familiar serious. with that. I'm not familiar yeah. with that. Yeah, I read that um, recently, and I was really surprised that, you know, it was really this, this you know, one predominant organization that came in during, um, you know, ICWA um, that, and, you know, under the auspices of helping, you know, these, these families, but really coming back to Pratt's, you know, uglier side. I loved how Sarah Young pointed out um, some of what Pratt contributed, you know, in her uh, boarding school webinar. Uh, but she also, you know, talked about obviously save, save the, the man and kill the Indian, you know, yeah. which is Pratt's uh, famous quote. And yeah. I just thought that was that was really interesting. Um, but it was still happening. And I'm sorry, there was a lot of information. Um, did you talk about the Supreme Court case and what's happening with that? Yeah, a, a that? little bit. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, that's being decided right now. And I yeah. know a lot of tribes yeah. and myself included are, are very worried about how this is going to turn out. Uh, and I sent Jennifer an article that quoted the parents in Texas who are suing the tribes are suing the government about ICWA. Uh, her, she said culture doesn't matter. Remember that? Um, the culture is not that important. This is the white parent wanting to adopt the, the native students. And so, you know, that is definitely coming from a sense of cultural superiority. You know, it's from a native perspective. Hey, culture is pretty darn important to me. But for the white parent adopting the native kid, she said culture is not that important. And uh, when I read that, I was like, that's why we have ICWA, is because of people's attitudes like that, thinking they're doing the best for Native kids by getting them out of Native communities. Mm -hmm. And so um, it, it's very interesting to see where this will go. Yeah, it, it sure is. Um, oh, good. Yes, that's, I think that is the article that I wrote. Somebody. Thank you, Diane. Somebody put that in there. Yeah, um, I've heard of tribes adopting non-native people into their tribe. Is this something some tribes do, or am I just hearing things wrong? Is this say that again, Jennifer? I've heard of tribes adopting air quotes uh, non-native people into their tribe. Is this something some tribes do, or am I just hearing things wrong? No, some tribes have adopted folks in. You know, they'll become like you know um, honorary members. I think the Crow tribe adopted Obama and actually gave them a crow name. And so, you know, that could happen. And so, you know, tribes can adopt people through a, you know, public ceremony, but then there are also individual families. Like I mentioned at the beginning, the Dakotas have a hunka ceremony, a making of relatives. And so you, you might be non-native, but get adopted into a family and become just like a member of the family. You may not be an official, you know, tribal member, but from the eyes of that family and the community you've been adopted to, you know, you're, you're Dakota. And so um, it's, it's, you know, those systems are still in place. But yes, yeah, folks can be adopted by tribes, um, but you might not get all the benefits. Yeah, yeah, well, that, that was a comment. Benefits, you know, there might not be many, like casinos, you know, some tribes have casinos or make a lot of money. Other tribes have casinos and no one's getting any money from their casino, just running, you know, supporting itself and maybe supporting a few tribal programs, but, you know, the individual members may not be getting any, you know, per cap from that casino. 
So um, and speaking of casinos, I just joined Gamblers Anonymous. Yeah, they gave me 10 to 1 odds. I wouldn't make it. So. Wow, the ICWA uh, Supreme Court story was on the German radio station. Um, our friend Andrea is in uh, at Ramstein Air Force Base. And uh, so, so Germany's talking about ICWA. Yeah, yeah, I, I find uh, that so interesting. Um, another really interesting conversation that you and I had was about the pretendian and uh <laughs> and I and I appreciated the article that you shared about the professor um you know who really is kind of in that in that gray area of you know something that she was raised with and so can you talk a little bit about that sure well there's a uh, pretending pretendians is uh Google it. There's a, there's a website I go to a lot, uh, Indians.com, and they have articles. But there, there's you know some of these uh, academics who are who claim native ancestry, you know for whatever reason they're finding out they're actually not native, and uh, and then so folks are calling them out on it and saying, hey, you know the tribe no has no idea who you are, but you've been saying you're part of our tribe, and so folks who have been appropriating native identity you know, for whatever, for their own benefit or to further their academic careers. Um, people are paying attention to that now. And, uh, but yeah, there's, so there's this whole notion about folks who have, you know, kind of um, appropriated native identity and built that into their persona and, you know, project that out there. But um, Ward Churchill was one of those guys uh, and a few others, uh, Elizabeth Warren, you know, actually, I uh, did some of that when she was at Harvard and uh, got called out on that. Um, but, you know, it's interesting when you say, well, it's like my family all said we were part Native, but then do you know for sure? And that's why it's so important to be able to, at least with Native people, because we are that uh, political category, to be able to, to trace your lineage and say, yes, I can point to this. My great, great, great Gampra was on the Dawes roll. Um, and so it's 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 a complex issue, but yeah. So there's this whole you know group of folks that uh, you know kind of appropriate native identity, and mm -hmm. uh, it's sad. But some cases they may not just know either. They may have grown up thinking that, and not have ever you know dug deeper to find out for sure. And like so, this professor, you know, she really yeah. thought that um, she went to ceremonies, she was, you know, raised in, in the community. So, um, you know, it only came about later that she discovered there actually was no, no Indian ancestry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that, yeah, so these are complex issues. So there's, you know, that the whole issue of cultural appropriation is, is another topic for discussion. But Absolutely. The, the, the folks feel like they uh, learned a little something new about blood quantum and how complex it is. And the, the main point I'm going to stress is tribes have their own rules and regulations for determining their own membership as sovereign entities. And so it's up to the tribes. And uh, but it's a complex issue. Um, yep. Keep keep throwing your questions in the chat. We're here for a, a few more minutes. So, um, so Mike, I'm super excited that uh, you are going to be presenting a sovereignty curriculum development workshop at the Indian Education for All Best Practices Conference, which is Save the Date. I put it in the chat. I'll put it in the chat again, March 17th and 18th. That's going to be happening here in Helena face to face. We're so excited. Registration is free. Um, but I'm really excited that you're going to be doing a whole curriculum development workshop. So Folks, keep an eye out for that. You know, hopefully by Donnie's uh, presentation next Thursday, I will have the registration open, and uh, you know, you you can you can pre-register for for Mike's workshop if you would like to to do some actual curriculum development with all of this. I know that mm -hmm. it is it is very complex. We definitely see that in in the feedback every week, and um, you know, this is. This has been amazing and, and educational, you know, for 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 me as well. So um, the oh, the articles from each nation. 
Yeah. You know, yeah, and and just looking at the constitutions, and um, so do take a look at those that resource list, folks. Um, as presenters have brought up different cases or different resources, I've added those as quickly as I can to the to the resource list. In addition, I've added the save the date information. And if any of you are doing really amazing things in your classroom, um, please make sure to, to complete a, a call for proposal application form. And we'd love to know um, what you're doing and we'd love to have you have you share um, with that. But sure. um, I'll, I'll just share a couple of things here then, Jennifer, real quick. Since it's winter time, I'll teach all of you the Lakota word for potato. The Lakota word for potatoes, blow. Blow means potato in a Lakota language. So in South Dakota, how the Lakota keep temperature in the wintertime is they take potatoes and put them outside. And if they wake up the next morning, if there's five potatoes froze, it's five blow. So horrible joke. <laughs> Jennifer, I, I spilt all this stuff on me. So you don't mind if I step out for a second? <laughs> it's all right it's all right well thank you mike so much and um so yes thank you mike and we know where to find you I we know run. Where to for, for more <laughs> resources and um, the, <laughs> the uh the feedback survey is is open and um yeah so just please make sure uh tuesday night is casey lozar he is a regent uh for the board of of um or for the higher board of higher ed in in Montana, he's fantastic, and he'll be talking about a little bit about educational sovereignty as well as like some financial sovereignty stuff. So I'm very excited. And on Thursday it'll be Donnie Wetzel, and he will wrap up our sovereignty series with uh, sovereignty in action and talking about how sovereignty applies to Native youth and 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 how elevating Native youth voices in education um, helps to uh, ha have them. Um, you know, feel that connection to individual sovereignty as well as sovereignty. But I can't thank you all enough um, for, again, your, your incredible feedback. It's really helping to, to drive, you know, your, your professional development. So please make sure to fill out that feedback survey and um, you get a few minutes this evening to drive extra carefully home. Uh, please stay safe and please stay warm. And we really look forward to seeing you for our last two uh, webinars next Tuesday and Thursday. Have a good evening, everybody.